Hi, I'm Jane Sanders, co-founder of the Sanders Institute. We believe a vital democracy requires an informed electorate, civil discourse, and bold progressive ideas. Today, we are here to discuss foreign policy, the military budget, and the needs of our veterans. While we usually discuss domestic and foreign policy separately, in truth, they are deeply intertwined. The choices we make as a country determine our national priorities and reflect our values. They indicate how we treat our citizens and how we treat others. Foreign policy is more than just war and peace. It is a nuanced and complex issue that directly affects us here at home. I'm honored to be joined today by one of our founding fellows, Representative Tulsi Gabbard. In addition to her work in the Sanders Institute and proudly serving in her home state of Hawaii in the United States Congress, Representative Gabbard is a major of the Army National Guard and one of the first female combat veterans to serve in Congress. Thank you for being here today, Tulsi. Thank you, Jane. It's great to see you. Good to see you as well. We've talked about foreign policy yeah. quite a bit over the years. Yes. Why is war and peace so important to you? It's a broad I, question. It, it's <laughs> a broad question, and, and I gotta tell you, growing up in beautiful Hawaii, surfing and hiking and, and just appreciating our home, um, this issue or this idea of, of what is the cost of war and how does it impact us honestly wasn't something that um, existed in my day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. um, after the attacks on 9-11, like so many people all across this country, um, those attacks, the thousands of lives lost uh, on that day, uh, the first responders who lost their lives and who those who didn't who continue to suffer today, those those things weighed heavily on my heart. Um, and I wanted to do something to go after the terrorists that launched that attack on our country. I didn't quite know how or in what way I could be of service, uh, but eventually ended up joining the Hawaii Army National Guard, primarily because um, I saw it as an opportunity to be able to continue trying to serve my state in some mm -hmm. way in times of natural disaster or need. Uh, but also to, to serve my country, uh, mm -hmm. if duty called. Mm -hmm. So um, it was about a year after I enlisted in the National Guard that uh, our unit, the 29th Brigade Combat Team, was called up for a deployment to Iraq. And for my unit, this was the first deployment that they had seen really since Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So a lot, I think most of, of the folks who were serving in our close to 3,000 person unit had never seen combat. Um, I was one of a few people, I was serving in a headquarters medical unit at the time, and I was one of a few people whose names were not on that mandatory deployment roster. Uh, I was serving in our state house of representatives at the time, and I remember uh, hearing notice of this mandatory deployment, uh, and then getting a call from my commander saying, hey, guess what, congratulations, mm. your name is not on the list. And I said, what do you mean? He says, no, you don't have to go. And I just, uh, we had a few conversations and I just, I knew very quickly that there was no way that I could stay back in beautiful Hawaii and watch my friends, my brothers and sisters in uniform uh, deployed to the other side of the world into mm -hmm. a war zone, not knowing um, if they would all be able to come home. Uh, so you so, went. So I did. I, I told my commander, I said, no, I'm, I'm going. Tell me what you need in your unit. Uh, and I ended up getting trained in a different job, volunteered for that deployment. Um, I was campaigning for re-election when all of this happened in Hawaii, so I withdrew from my re-election campaign and uh, went on this deployment. It was 18 months long. We spent 12 months in country in Iraq. And uh, serving in a medical unit saw firsthand um, the cost of war. Yeah. It really opened my eyes and made an impact um, made an impact on me in so many different ways. Coming home from that deployment and then I volunteered on a second deployment with the Hawaii National Guard a few years later, um, understanding and seeing the human cost of war mm -hmm. on our troops, um, the stresses and sacrifices that our military families make, uh, the impact of uh, this regime change war on the people mm -hmm. in Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, that's really what motivated me after both of those deployments to come home and to want to 
to do something about it, to try to find a way to, to bring those experiences to light, to stop our country yeah. from continuing to make these disastrous, devastating decisions that are so costly for our troops and their families, for the people in these countries where we launch these regime change wars, but really for the American people as well, who have now since 9-11 paid trillions of dollars to pay for this, these continued counterproductive regime change wars. Yeah, well you've talked about a lot in there. We yeah. need to take them one at a time. Yeah. Uh, the veterans, the military families, yeah. uh, the continuing wars. Um, right now, uh, you have uh, come up with some legislation yeah. to stop the U.S. support of the Saudi Arabia war in, in Yemen. Yes. Um, it's been a, an incredible uh, disaster, humanitarian disaster. Yeah. It's gone on for three years. The United States has provided military support mm -hmm. and technical support, logistical support, mm -hmm. air refueling. Uh, tell us why this legislation is important and tell us a little bit more about sure. what the legislation will do. Absolutely, I think there's two, there's two main issues to address with this um, genocidal war that Saudi Arabia is waging in Yemen right now that's created the worst humanitarian disaster in the world. Mm -hmm. And the United States is standing shoulder to shoulder supporting Saudi Arabia in this war as they commit these atrocities against Yemeni civilians. Mm -hmm. um, one issue is the fact that Congress has not authorized this war. As you know, the Constitution very clearly states that the responsibility lies within Congress to make that decision. Do you declare war or not? Do you but go to war or not? But we haven't done that since World War exactly. II. Exactly. And after Vietnam, they had the resolution that in, in 1973 mm -hmm. that said uh, Congress has to be the only it, one it to declare war. It reaffirmed what was right. already in yes. the Constitution with the War Powers Resolution. And then after 9-11, uh, exactly. We went exactly the opposite and broadened the president's uh, ability to make unilateral and, decisions. And really, too many people in Congress didn't want to take that responsibility mm -hmm. of, of making sure that as elected leaders in this country, we're fulfilling that responsibility and making that tough call. It's, it's unfortunately oftentimes easier for politicians to mm -hmm. point the finger and say, hey, that was a bad decision. But when Congress has sidestepped its mm -hmm. role, has ceded its responsibility to the executive branch, um, you know, th that's the problem in both. The problem is with the executive branch overstepping its boundaries and Congress not abdicating. Exactly. And you, you're right. It's so much easier. Yeah. I remember the first vote that Bernie mm -hmm. uh, cast when he was in Congress was against the Iraq War. Wow. And he said, you know, I have to do this. Yeah. It will mean I'm a one-term congressman. Mm. And we both agreed he had to do what you his do conscience the right thing. told him. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. But, and thank goodness the people understood later. But it was a rough two years. Right. And, so. and a, costly, a costly decision. And, and mm -hmm. that's one of the biggest problems that we face now is that lack of foresight mm -hmm. where you have people who may have good intentions um, but aren't looking down the line and realizing that uh, I think, what is the saying, the, the road to hell is often paved with good intentions, yes. yeah. and why it's so important for our leaders to understand the cost of war. Mm -hmm. And the situation with Yemen, not only are, do we have an illegal war that the United States is waging with Saudi Arabia in Yemen, but the atrocities that are occurring there, yeah. um, it is, it's just outrageous that this is continuing. Our U.S. taxpayer dollars are being used to help refuel Saudi planes, to provide precision missiles that Saudi Arabia is that using. That are not using, if they're, they're, they're hitting the wrong them, exactly. targets. On yeah. weddings, on uh, most buses. recently on a school bus, killing 40 children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's, it is long overdue for Congress to assert its role mm -hmm. and to stop all U.S. military support for Saudi Arabia and specifically with this uh, interventionist war in Yemen. Mm -hmm. So that's what our resolution does. Um, we'll be introducing it shortly really to draw the line and say uh, this is an illegal war and our U.S. military must end their participation and their support in any way, shape or form 
for this genocidal war that Saudi Arabia continues to wage. Mm -hmm. You mentioned two things. One, it, this legislation deals with Saudi Arabia and yeah. Yemen, yet we've accelerated our weapons sales to yeah. all the other countries. Uh, you have anything to say about that? Well, yeah. it's, this is such a, um, an eye-opening point because so often when we look at these different wars and you find and, and trace what are the causes, oftentimes uh, the folks who benefit most are the military industrial complex mm -hmm. and the defense contractors. And just a couple of days ago there were reports that as uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was in a position to make a decision about whether or not to continue uh, this support for Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen, he ultimately made the decision to continue and affirm United States support for Saudi Arabia, largely because if he had not, then it would have jeopardized a $2 billion arms deal that the United States has with Saudi Arabia and the UAE in the sale of these precision missiles that Saudi Arabia is using in this war. Mm. So this unfortunately is not getting a lot of coverage in the media because I think that the American people, if they understood that these leaders are making decisions mm -hmm. for profits on the backs of the lives of these innocent civilians mm -hmm. in Yemen, it's heartbreaking it to is. see how these millions of people's lives have just been devastated by the continuance of this war. And as you said, we're not hearing about it in the media. And it goes back to something else that you mentioned. You said that it, we don't have enough foresight right. as we go into these wars. Now, there are people that clearly indicated these are the things that will happen if yeah. we go into Iraq. Mm -hmm. These are the questions we still have. That's right. Uh, there are people with foresight, but those are not the people that are on the talk shows yeah. to discuss the upcoming conflicts or the existing conflicts. They're the people that actually got us into trouble in previous conflicts. Yeah. How do we change that? Are you on very much to talk about uh, the specific concerns yeah. that are that are happening? I don't yeah. I don't see you as much as the people that have been so supportive of the military industrial complex for decades. Yeah, and and that's where again, if if you if you look at the money and look at the folks who are um, continuing to push a very specific narrative that does not examine the true cost of war, that does not ask the tough questions. Mm -hmm. And actually they kind of uh, try to turn the tables around and punish people who try to ask the tough questions. Mm -hmm. And th this, this um, applies to political leaders, it applies to uh, many in the mainstream media who just go along yeah. uh, without actually doing the kinds of analysis and tough journalism and reporting that the American people deserve. Mm -hmm. And it even goes to many of the think tanks that exist within Washington. Mm -hmm. And if you look at uh, who's funding those think tanks and who benefits from the opinions and the ideas that they're putting forward, again, then you can start to look at who benefits, who benefits from continuing these destructive costly regime change wars. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, it's very clear now over years that the political leadership in Washington, those in the media, seem to um, not pay any attention and not learn the lessons of the consequences of the, the regime change war in Iraq, mm -hmm. of the regime change war in Libya, and the regime change war we've been waging now for years in Syria. Yes. And who suffers the most as a result mm -hmm. of those wars? It's the people in those countries. Mm -hmm. And yet, we, as you say, we haven't learned anything from the past. I mean, right. we can look back, uh, Allende uh, in Chile, uh, Mossadegh, you know, I mean. It goes back for, it, for decades. Mm -hmm. And yet, we keep on returning to that failed yeah. policy. Yeah. And this is why leadership is so important. Right, right. This is why that foresight we're talking about, leadership with foresight that will make, uh, that will exercise good judgment, mm -hmm. that um, will have the courage to stand up in the face of the criticism of those with the money or those with the media platforms or those who are trying to push a certain agenda and take a stand for the people, mm -hmm. the people of our country, mm -hmm. the people of these other countries and take a stand for peace. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And I think that it's a very difficult thing to do. And 
people find that they've been, that the people that are saying uh, a different chord, yeah. singing a different so song might be right, mm -hmm. but they find out 10 years later after they've gone through three or four years of division yeah. and, uh, and derision exactly. of, of, of them as, as people. It's, it worries me very much that in our democracy, yes. the prevailing wisdom is the one that always prevails mm -hmm. and it's often wrong. And yet, as you say, it's the, the media and the politicians mm -hmm. that keep that going, keep the framework of the discussion very, very narrow. Yeah, yeah, um, I couldn't agree more. The, mm -hmm. the um, suppression of true debate, of, of thinking critically, mm -hmm. uh, being skeptical about mm -hmm. certain things that you may see on TV or certain things that you're told. Mm -hmm. And again, this all comes back to understanding uh, specifically as we're talking about the issue of war and peace, what is the cost of war? What are the consequences of these decisions that we're making? And this is what's necessary for our leadership. Well, the cost of war, we, we, we strongly agree that yeah. we need to take care of our veterans. Yeah. But it seems that we've made some progress over the last several years in providing equipment and, and support for our soldiers mm -hmm. in war. Mm -hmm. But when they come home, not so much progress mm -hmm. from back from Agent Orange in the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. PTSD uh, in the Iraq War, and now uh, the cancers and the undiagnosed illnesses that are a result of open burn pits, yeah. according to the veterans, are not being taken seriously. None of them were taken seriously. They had to fight their government when they got home. Yeah. What can you tell us about that? Are you making any progress? Are you getting Congress to listen to the veterans a little bit quicker? Yeah. We do not take care of them, at least in my opinion, yeah. to the extent that we need this, to. This is one of the most troubling things is that, you know, I sit on the Armed Services Committee mm -hmm. and there is a lot of conversation and a lot of focus on, you know, weapon systems and these sorts of things, on, on troop readiness and training and mm -hmm. everything else, uh, which is important. Uh, but when you look at the amount of money and focus and time and attention that is put into um, that end of war, yeah. um, how conversely that compares to um, the amount of money, time, and attention that's put into, first of all, let's help folks when they get home, yeah. as they lay down their uniform and transition into civilian life in whatever way they choose, how much are we investing in their success? We pay a lot of money to have a highly trained, capable <coughs> military. How much are we investing in those individuals when they come home after they have served and sacrificed for our country to make sure that they have all the tools that they need to be successful in whatever path they choose to continue on in their life? Very little when you look at that in comparison. And this goes <coughs> back to, and then you follow that up to, with, um, uh, the visible and invisible wounds that folks come home from war yes. with and identifying those seeing how can we how how we can prevent them how can we treat them again how can we better equip them and you mentioned the uh, the open burn pits is a, a perfect example of how unfortunately the VA continues to be behind the curve on taking care of our veterans um, our camp when we were in Iraq was about 40 miles north of Baghdad. It was a relatively large camp with folks from all different branches of service there. And every day there was a huge burn pit mm -hmm. where everything went and was burned. Mm. You know, there's no recycling and separation of trash. Everything mm -hmm. went into this burn pit. And there were people from different units who were there, including ours, who were stationed at that burn pit. There are people who are pulling guard duty in towers right next to that burn pit. And there was a constant cloud of smelly ash, for lack of a better term, that hung over our camp mm -hmm. that came from this burn pit. And so the, the s illnesses, respiratory problems, kind of very premature unidentified cancers that folks are starting to come down with, mm -hmm there is not the mechanism in place for the VA to say, well, we think that very likely came from your exposure to these burn pits. They haven't even been tracking mm -hmm. veterans' exposure. So, you know, we've introduced legislation to mandate 
the tracking of this uh, burn pit exposure. Right now it's voluntary. Any veteran can go and put their names in the registry if they want. Yeah. But then also to do the studies that will require the VA to say that there is a, there is a high likeliness that these you know, folks who are 35 years old coming down with respiratory illnesses that in some cases are taking their lives, that they shouldn't have, yeah. that yeah. they wouldn't have in any other circumstance. So forcing the VA not to wait as Vietnam veterans have been forced to wait with Agent Orange for decades yes. before they've been able to receive care mm -hmm. with many dying of different kinds of cancers, but recognizing this crisis exists today mm -hmm. for this post 9-11 generation of veterans and let us learn from the mistakes that have been made in the past and make sure they have the care that they need today. Yeah, if we had Medicare for all, that might be, be helpful to the veterans exactly. as well. You Absolutely. don't have to prove where it came from. Uh, you get the care but that you it's, need. They're trying to deal with their lives. They're yes. trying to deal with their families. And, and uh, it's heartbreaking to it watch them is. have to fight our government to get the care they need. Exactly. So how are domestic and foreign policy inextricably joined together? You know, it, it is... A, a, always shocking to me when you hear people say, oh, okay, you know, the issue of war and peace is important, but there are so many other issues here at home mm -hmm. that we really need to focus on without really understanding that, as you said, they are inextricably linked. Mm -hmm. That as long as we continue to spend trillions of dollars on these counterproductive, costly regime change wars, those are trillions of dollars that we do not have mm -hmm. to invest in rebuilding infrastructure in our communities to make sure that our children have clean water to drink, to actually help the people in Flint, in Flint Michigan who continue to drink contaminated and poisoned water, to be able to invest in a healthcare system mm -hmm. that really serves everyone who needs it, to improve our education, to make sure there's affordable housing. There's so many yeah. challenges that exist right here in our communities. And so to talk about healthcare and education and housing, how can you talk about these domestic challenges and solutions unless you recognize that the limited resources that we have are currently being wasted yeah. on perpetuating these endless regime change wars. Mm -hmm. I agree. And it's not just Flint, unfortunately, that has water problems that are popping up all over the country. Exactly. And water scarcity mm -hmm. is starting to become a thing that uh, people are worried about, though I don't think that there's much discussion about that. Yeah, yeah. water is life. And the more people really start to think about that, Mm -hmm. look at how our water is being wasted, how our water in many cases is being contaminated because of our addiction to fossil fuels, mm -hmm. look at our, our um, agribusiness, agriculture industry. As we start to look at a lot of these different things, I think it's necessary that we recognize and really place at a higher level of importance the necessity yeah. of clean water yeah. for us to live and for our food and, and really for our future. Right, which is why we need a Green New Deal yes. for the future, to be able to be getting a, as, as uh, developing as much as we like, but doing it in an environmentally sound way. Yes. And, you know, nobody's talking about stopping progress. They're mm -hmm. talking about Smart enabling progress. it. Yes. Exactly. So making so making real better progress. decisions. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've talked about Syria a yeah. bit. Uh, the John Bolton, uh, President Trump, Nikki Haley have mm -hmm. all talked about uh, going to war in Syria. Yeah. That would mean not just against Syria, it would be against Russia and Iran. Yeah. Um, what do you think, I, I know what you think about that, but yeah. um, what do you think the implications, what's your foresight on that? Exactly, once again, this is um, where it is so necessary to look ahead and not treat this situation lightly, mm -hmm. and how the um, beating of the war drums by President Trump and those in his administration that you talked about, threatening dire consequences if these countries attack Al-Qaeda mm -hmm. in the city of Idlib in Syria that, that Al-Qaeda currently controls. Which is rather ironic. Exactly. Yeah. Ironic and a complete betrayal mm -hmm. 
of the American people, of those who lost their lives on 9-11, of our troops who've been fighting against terrorism, mm -hmm. of their families. It's, it's just, um, it's insane, frankly, mm -hmm. that uh, we would hear these threats coming from the United States president, a commander in chief, that uh, they will force dire consequences in the use of military force against these other countries who... To protect Al-Qaeda. Exactly, to protect yes. Al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. begs the question of why. Mm -hmm. um, since 2011, when the United States, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and these other countries started this uh, kind of slow, drawn-out regime change war in mm -hmm. Syria, uh, it is terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda, uh, Al-Nusra, um, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, these different groups that, that have morphed and taken on different names but essentially are all uh, linked with Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda mm -hmm. themselves that have proven to be the most effective ground force against the government in trying to overthrow the, the Syrian government. Uh, so President Trump and, and his war cabinet now recognize that if Al-Qaeda is destroyed in Idlib in Syria, which is kind of their last stand, then that ground force will be gone mm -hmm. and this regime change war in effect will be over. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something that must be condemned by every member of Congress and we must understand that what is being threatened could kick off World War III and especially when we're dealing with Russia, you know, another nuclear armed state yeah. in, the, in the world Mm -hmm. that has their nuclear missiles pointed directly at us that could mm -hmm. be shot off at any given moment. You're, th you're th really threatening um, devastation and suffering mm -hmm. that we haven't seen in our lifetime. And yet we're not seeing it on the news. We're not debating the issues on the news. We're not having even guests. All, we're focused on the latest scandal yeah. all the time. Yeah. Uh, and it's, tr you know, Trump all the time. Yeah. What, it, what his latest tweet was, instead of actually dealing with the issues. That will affect our, our country, yeah. our, our families, our soldiers. Yeah. The um, American people deserve better. And mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you how many people I talk to who just say, you know what, I can't watch the quote unquote news <coughs> anymore because right. they're not actually getting the news. They're getting a lot of just these salacious things that, mm -hmm. that you yeah. know, drive up ratings but really don't address um, the real decisions and challenges and, and events that, that are impacting right. our everyday lives. Right. And they're, you know, uh, the autocratic nature of this president mm -hmm. and all over the world, Steve Bannon is getting all these right wing uh, groups very active and, and leadership uh, in countries. I'm worried that there's not much interest in creating a vital democracy mm. where people are informed well enough to be able to discuss and debate and weigh in on the issues. I mean, I don't think that it's a mistake that there is not much. I don't, I don't blame the media for this directly. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think our leadership in our nation right now is happy to have us be discussing things that really will not affect our lives yeah. instead of being able to weigh in and say, yeah. wait, this is not what we want as yeah. a democracy. And that really speaks to the disconnect, I believe, within Washington and the bubble that exists there, mm -hmm. uh, the disconnect between that bubble and the real lives and mm -hmm. and you know challenges, concerns, hopes, and dreams that are happening yeah. in our communities in Hawaii and Vermont and, and mm -hmm. in every state across the country where they they want more from our leadership. Yeah. They want us to be listening to their concerns and their mm -hmm. challenges. They want us to be actually taking action mm -hmm. to, to deliver results that can help them and provide a better future for their kids. Mm -hmm. And bridging that divide and actually going out and listening to folks um, and hearing about what they care about, I think, is, is uh, what more people in Washington really need to do. Well, and also that they, they decide how to cover things in a way that is not really informative. Yeah. It's, um, for instance, 
the lava flow mm -hmm. in Hawaii, the fires in California, the exactly. devastation in Puerto Rico, and what's happening in North Carolina yeah. now. They'll say that they give a lot of attention to it, mm -hmm. but they give attention from a voyeur's perspective. That's a very good point. Instead of from a, a you know, listen to the science. That's Why is this happening? Yeah. Maybe we should figure out what policies we need right. to turn this back. Right. Uh, yeah. So climate change and the climate crisis mm -hmm. uh, demands people know right. about what's going on. Right. So I think North Carolina is a uh, obviously a, a, a very recent tragedy that's occurring there, mm -hmm. and I've seen very little coverage about how uh, many of the other. Uh, I think there's there's pig farms in the area, there are mm -hmm. coal mines, and there are other um, environmental crises that mm -hmm. are also occurring around the devastation and flooding that we have seen mm -hmm. um, that haven't gotten the attention they deserve because uh, people need to understand and know what kinds of threats exist for them and their families and their communities, their water, mm -hmm. their future, that come from these other things, yet no one is talking about that. No. We need to cover the science, yeah. and we need to cover the facts. Yeah. So yeah. there's some potential good news uh, in foreign policy. Uh, what do you think about what's happening in North Korea? Do you think that there's a chance of denuclearization, such as President Trump and uh, the presidents of South Korea and North Korea are yeah. talking about? Uh, I have hope. It's definitely not an easy task mm -hmm. at hand. Uh, but it's one that I and, you know, folks in Hawaii and people across the country are paying very close attention to. Mm -hmm. You know, Hawaii sits within range of North Korea's intercontinental ballistic missiles. So yes. for years, you know, I've been uh, working in Congress and calling for direct engagement with North Korea, with Kim Jong-un, to be able to try to broker and negotiate a peace agreement that will result in denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula and finally bringing about an end mm -hmm. to the Korean War. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that the recent engagement that we have seen, both uh, that historic meeting between a sitting U.S. president and the leader of North Korea, uh, is certainly a positive step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. We have to be willing to have these conversations mm -hmm. uh, to pursue peace. Um, I think that the continued engagement between North Korea and South Korea is positive. Um, there are many details that need to be worked out. Um, there's a lot of history on both sides that has yeah. to be dealt with as we navigate this path forward. But I think it's critical that we continue to pursue it uh, because the alternative is something that, that really is not uh, acceptable. I agree. So we are, we are in we one, are one place we're moving hopeful. forward. Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> cautiously hopeful. <laughs> Uh, to go back to being maybe a little less uh, hopeful, um, although hope springs eternal, yeah. the long-standing conflict in the Middle East mm -hmm. uh, is seems to be getting worse. I remember sitting on the White House lawn yeah. when uh, President Bill Cl Clinton brought Itzhak Rabin, I the Israeli president, and Yasser Arafat from the Palestinian mm -hmm. leader, and they shook hands on the Oslo Accord, and it felt like we were moving in the right direction for the yeah. first time in many, many years. It feels like we've gone way back. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah. I, I, I share kind of the same sadness um, that you feel that um, rather than finding those kinds of platforms and creating those opportunities um, for engagement, between the leaders of both Israel and Palestine to be able to start to build that path towards peace, and towards a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, we are seeing um, the existing divide grow bigger and bigger. Um, you know, I think the, um, just the, the apparent just lack of empathy and, and lack of recognition of the humanity mm -hmm. that we all share um, is really unfortunate mm -hmm. and that rather than really doing things in a meaningful way that can bring those leaders together that can seek to bring the people together um, we're just seeing um, we're just seeing that divide grow and grow yeah um, and so you know this is whether it's it's um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict other conflicts within the Middle East 
uh, North Korea. I think these are all examples that we can point to um, that affirm the need for leaders to be willing to sit down with those who may be their adversaries, mm -hmm. those who may be their enemies, those who may be dictators, if mm. we're really serious about achieving peace. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, Great. thank you, Tulsi, for being thank here you. and for everything that you do, both in the National Guard, in Congress, uh, at the Sanders Institute. Um, your voice is extremely important, and I just always love to be in conversation with you. It's great to see you always, Jane. Thanks for having me, and uh, it's a pleasure to, to be a part of this great work that you're doing.